fellow assassins to another episode of the Dark Assassins Podcast, the show that dives deep into not just technology, but the concepts, software, and procedures behind it all, and explains it so simply that even your grandma can understand it. As always, I'm your host, the Dark Assassin. Happy New Year, my fellow assassins. We are in another year. Okay, yes, I know technically the when this podcast airs, it's still technically December, which I'm going to use to my advantage, um, as you will see later in the episode. But depending on when some of you are listening to this episode, it very, way, very well may be the new year. So in any case, I am going to say it. Happy New Year. Here's to 2024. And as I mentioned in the previous episode of the podcast, the Christmas one, uh, this is going to kind of be a bit of a two-part series, I guess. I mean, it's not really a series, but kind of, sort of. Last year, we talked about a bunch of different open source projects from things you can run in your home lab to things you can take advantage of as a developer. And this time, we're going to go over what kind of hardware you can also use uh, to put some of those open source projects to use. So in this episode, I kind of wanted to kind of give go over the uh, the uh, the question of if I had to rebuild my home lab from scratch, what would I do? Like, what would I do first? What's the first things I would go for? Um, and then if I had, like, X number of dollars to spend on creating a new home lab from scratch, you know, how would I elect uh, to spend that money? So I thought that would be kind of a fun thing to do uh, here for the New Year's special, I guess, if you will, and as a continuation um, as part of this uh, two-part series of sorts, if you will. But first, let's get into this week's trivia question. So in the spirit of hardware, what is the maximum supported resolution of DVI? So what is the maximum supported resolution of DVI? And that is your trivia question for the week. And let's just keep things right on rolling with this week's cybersecurity tip. So this week's cybersecurity tip is one that really pains me that it's a it's a thing although at the same time I can't really say that I'm surprised due to uh, social engineering attacks being so so successful I guess you could say um, and this one is I guess apparently known as the grandparent scam so some of you may have heard this maybe you actually heard from your grandparent in regards to this uh, but basically the idea is that there are people out there that are trying to scam grandparents into giving the money pretend either pretending to be or claiming that their grandchildren is your child is somehow in some kind of emergency and they need money immediately and of course the grandparent being the sweet amazing person that they are they're going to help their grandchild any way that they can um so of course this you know being the social engineering exploit trying to take advantage of that vulnerability if you will um so yeah, so in, in any case, how they're doing this is they're they're spoofing phone numbers, for one thing. So they're basically making it look like the phone number that they're calling your grandparent with is, you know, maybe like a local number or something, um, or possibly maybe your number, potentially, although they'll probably just try to do a local phone number to whatever your grandparent's phone number is. Um, and then they're apparently even trying to, <laughs> because everyone is, uh, implementing artificial intelligence and machine learning um, into making fake voices to, I guess, try to imitate your voice or imitate someone else's voice. Um, so, yeah, the, I guess the, the first thing that we need to address here is to the scammers out there, how dare you prey on our grandparents like that because... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Um, secondly, uh, specifically to the grandparents out there, 
first, if you ever get one of these kinds of messages, hang up the phone immediately. Or if you want to be nice, you can try to make some excuse that like you'll have to call them back because like something came up or someone's at the door, or, you know, some some excuse to get off the phone. And more likely than not, if this is a scam, which it is, they'll do whatever they can to keep you on the phone and try not to lose you because there's no way that you'll be able to call them back. And that is obviously red flag number one. And the, th- the thing with these scammers is it's kind of similar to another cybersecurity tip we had a few months ago, which is the idea of when scammers will send phishing attacks to you trying to pose as say like your bank or some other organization like the the IRS or the government or someone basically telling you that you owe them money for some reason here click this link Um, or there was a some suspicious activity on your account here click this link you know things like that and we talked about in that episode the first thing you want to do is you want to check who the email is being sent from because if it's not being sent by the person who claims they're sending the email, you know that it's spam, it's trash, just disregard it. The second thing you need to look for as well is to look at the IP, not the IP address, but the URL of the message they're trying to send you to, or the link they're trying to send you to. Because if it's not the domain of the supposed organization, like say you're trying to Uh, Say Capital One sends you a message saying that there is some suspicious activity on your account and the domain that they're trying to send you to is Capital One, but the A is a 4 and the O is a 0 or something like that, you know it's not a legit site, so don't click on it. And if you're really, really suspicious, which honestly I would just encourage you to do this from the get-go, is to go directly to whatever organization site it is. Don't click anything in the email. Just go directly to the site, log into your account, and if there actually is something that needs your attention, once you log in, there will be an alert somewhere to let you know that something actually happened. Otherwise, you won't see anything, and you'll know it's spam. So the same thing happens here with the grandparent scam. So to the grandparents out there, if you do get one of these suspicious calls from either someone claiming to be your grandchild or someone to be claiming to be calling you on behalf of your grandchild, first what you need to do is hang up the phone and tell them you'll you'll call them back or you'll text them back or whatever the case may be. Get off the phone and then you either contact your grandchild directly or you contact your child, a.k.a. your grandchild's parent, directly and ask them if something is actually up and if everything's okay. Uh, Because that way you're going directly to the source and bypassing this uh, sketchy link, if you will, if we're taking this back to, um, like, you know, emails and phishing attacks and scam text messages and all that kind of thing. So, so yes, don't interact with the scammer. And if for whatever reason your grandchild actually is in some kind of emergency, you could just contact them directly and, and handle it that way. So that is your cybersecurity tip for the week. So obviously with that one, I would encourage all of you uh, to send that off to your grandparents uh, and let them know uh, not to, to fall for that. Now, seeing that this is the last episode of the year kind of branching in to the new year, one thing that we did last year on the podcast on the same exact episode, the one like right before the new year, was we went over the Spotify wrapped, which I still haven't looked at mine. It's been like not pestering me, but every time I upload a new episode, it's always there. And I decided what the heck we can, I guess, go through this briefly um, just to kind of to wrap out the year um, and get into the next year. So I am going to be doing this totally live, if you will, in the sense that um, I haven't seen this before as I click through it, so 
I guess we'll see uh, what this is. So they say in 2023, people were really, really feeling what you do. Um, Okay, that's, I guess, interesting, I guess. Um, I guess apparently you guys like the episodes and and the show. Um, So according to the Spotify Wrapped, um, the top episode of the year was I Use Arch, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which to me that's just kind of funny because um I do use arch by the way um in case you're wondering which I guess um I might be a fake fan in that sense because I haven't mentioned to you that I use arch on every single episode um since that episode where I I brought it to your attention that I do use arch um so maybe I need to make that a point to fully embrace the fact that I use arch linux by the way um by telling you that I I do in fact um use arch arch by the way um so according anyway that was supposedly the the top episode and according to them it was streamed 246 percent more than your average episode which uh i guess people (laughs) the arch fanboys came out for that one i guess um compared to, to the other ones um here they say how does it feel to have gone global which i'm not exactly sure why they're phrasing it like that because even from like the get-go last year i'm pretty sure there was technically a global audience although granted um it's still vastly dominated by the united states which again here on the next slide you were streamed in nine countries the united states was your top country um honestly not much of a shock there um what is a little interesting is it says with 44% of your total streams was from the U.S. I think that's what it's referring to, which uh, based on my analytics, I don't think that's right uh, because I think the U.S. is like 70 or 80%, so I'm not sure why that says 44 but uh, I guess that's cool. Um, oh, here's something that's interesting. I'm not sure how they're pulling this but it says uh you have the most new listeners from the united kingdom huh that's interesting um especially because like i said based on the analytics that i've seen the the united kingdom i don't even think is like all that highly rated uh let's go actually go to the analytics here um if we go to the audience yeah like the United Kingdom is, let's see, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Number five on the list at 2%, and the U.S. is at 83%. So I'm not exactly sure how Spotify is pulling these numbers. Uh, they seem a tiny bit fishy to me, uh, but, you know, <laughs> this is, like I said, just kind of uh, seeing it for the first time. Um, oh, here they go. Now, now Spotify is complimenting you guys, rightfully so. Uh, your listeners have good taste, obviously. Um, so now it says, let's see what else they're into. Um, interesting. So according to Spotify, uh, you guys, your top podcast genres were comedy, technology, which I guess technology shouldn't be a surprise, seeing that this is a technology related podcast and then business number three so interesting um let's see oh here we go your your listeners top music genres were rock pop and classic rock hmm i i will say um generally speaking i will agree that you guys at least according to this have uh, some some pretty good taste in music um now it's asking if I'm a gardener. That's, that's a little weird. Um, oh, here we go. Now it makes sense because your podcast saw some nice growth this year. So let's see. So listeners was apparently up 111%. So basically doubling number of listeners. That's pretty awesome to see. Streams up 188%. Followers was up 28%, and minutes, minutes Created was up 97%. So very interesting numbers there. Um, the one that kind of, well, I guess the two that really stick out to me is those listeners and streams numbers, mainly because I think I mentioned like a few episodes back 
Uh, one thing that I noticed, which I thought was absolutely crazy, was that like a single episode now generally tends to get more listens than like a month's worth or like a month and a half's worth of episodes when I first started making this podcast. So obviously um, the the show's been growing and that is no thanks to you guys because you're the ones that are sharing it around because um, <laughs> if a little into my personal life here I don't actually share this at all like on any of my personal accounts so as far as anyone's concerned that only follows like my personal social media accounts they know nothing of this Um, which I guess that's not not really saying much because I think the last post I made on Facebook was whenever I came out with my elite encryption algorithm which that was a while ago and then I think my last Instagram post was like two and a half years ago. LinkedIn, I don't know if I've really ever posted on there. Maybe like my elite encryption algorithm algorithm again. Maybe. But but yeah, I really don't post on there. So literally all of this growth is is purely you guys and I guess maybe potentially algorithm, but that is also because you guys are the ones listening. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's pretty much all that this has in here. Yeah. So that, so that's everything. So that's, that's, uh, I guess the Spotify wrap for the episode. Um, definitely cool to see the, uh, the growth, um, that the podcast has had. Um, like I said, I, I'm honestly kind of shocked on how, uh, seeing, just seeing the numbers and kind of just, you know, seeing it grow. So again, thanks to you guys so much uh, for, you know, liking the episodes, sharing them around, leaving ratings and reviews and and all that good stuff. So with that out of the way, let's get into some home lab goodness. And that being, uh, if I had to rebuild my home lab from scratch, what would I do first? So I think first, just right off the bat, The first things that I would prioritize is some kind of DNS solution and some kind of VPN solution. So the DNS solution I'd probably elect with something like Pi-hole just because the internet is full of horrible ads that I don't want to see. So I want to block as many of them as I can. So just having a general ad blocking thing for my DNS is nice. Plus, the other addition that Pi-hole has in addition to blocking ads is it also blocks a lot of tracker type stuff to help you keep you uh, more anonymous, not anonymous, but, you know, help block some some kinds of tracking. And you can also configure Pi-hole, which is how I have it configured, as a reverse DNS. So rather than Every time you reach out to a website, you're always going to say Cloudflare or you're always going to your ISP or you're always going to Google or whoever your DNS provider is. Rather than always going to that one source to get the domain name resolution, to get the IP address so your computer knows how to get to where it's trying to go, um, basically how the reverse DNS works is you go to the DNS server of whoever owns the domain name for the domain you're trying to go to. So if it's like .com, you go to the .com one. Um, If it's a .net, you go to the .net one. So basically the idea is you're going to different places for your DNS rather than always one place because if you're always going to, say, Google for your DNS, yeah, you might be, you know, all fancy like with your uh, encrypted tunnel through your VPN, But Google is still seeing all your DNS queries, so they have a pretty darn good idea of what you're doing. Same thing with your ISP, um, and that is one way, as we talked about, I don't know when it was, but I know we talked about it, how you can have DNS leaks if you're trying to um, sail the high seas, if you will. Um, I had a one of my friend's dads, I think, was <laughs> that's how his ISP or his ISP basically forwarded him the 
whatever the angry letter is that companies will send you when you're trying to sail the high seas for their products or whatever. Um, they'll, they'll send you these like nasty messages basically telling you to stop what you're doing essentially. Um, but the reason they got them was essentially because of that DNS leak where they were, they were able to see the DNS queries, even though his traffic was all going through an encrypted tunnel, the DNS queries weren't. So they were able to put two and two together. Hmm. He's downloading a lot of data and he happened to request the site of this, um, site out on the high seas. So I think we kind of know what he's up to. So, so yeah. Um, but, but that's not to say if you use a recursive DNS solution, that still won't happen to you. It definitely will. Um, so, yeah. But we're, we're not going to get into how to necessarily combat that. The main solution is you send, you have to have your DNS also go through that encrypted tunnel so you don't leak the DNS. But anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. So those are the two things that I would probably do first is set up Pi-hole and set up a VPN so I can get back into my home network. Those would probably be the first two things I would do. And the really nice thing about both of those is they're very low weight, I guess I can I'll guess I'll say. So meaning that I don't have to have like super powerful hardware in order to run them. I could easily run both of those things in Docker containers. Um, and right now, I mean, I'm technically running three different Pi-hole instances, but that is purely out of, you know, a, a redundancy aspect. So I can take one of my hypervisors down and I'll still have DNS and I'll still be able to access the internet. Uh, so that's kind of the main reason I did it. But if I had to go like super, super slim, I mean, only having one would be fine. It's just nice to kind of have multiple, just kind of have that that backup. Um, so now let's get into if I had ser- some sort sort of money, what would I do as far as the home lab is concerned? So let's say hypothetically, I am a broke college kid, like most college kids are, or I am still in high school, or just for whatever reason, I don't have any money whatsoever to spend on a home lab, or maybe I'm kind of not sure if it's something I want to get into, so I don't want to throw money at this, and I just kind of want to get my feet wet, as it were. So the budget is a whopping zero dollars. So this one actually is pretty easy for me because this is essentially how I started out back, back, back before I even knew that home labbing was even a thing or it even had a name. I just thought the idea of hosting a server was cool because it is. Um, So, but I didn't really have money to spend on actually buying a server. So what I decided to do and what I would recommend if you have no money is to throw VirtualBox or QEMU or some hypervisor, type 2 hypervisor solution onto your laptop or desktop or what have you to just play around with virtual machines. So as a refresher, there are two kinds of hypervisors. There's your type 1 hypervisors, which run bare metal. So uh, basically what that means is all virtual machines have access to the physical hardware on the device itself, whereas the type 2 hypervisors have an operating system layer in between them. So that's like your virtual box, your VMware Fusion or VMware Workstation, that kind of a thing, where it has to go through the operating system first. So as far as performance goes, your type 1 hypervisors are obviously going to be a lot better. But if you're trying to have a home lab alongside your like only laptop or your only desktop and you can't afford to throw like an actual hypervisor on there um then going with a type 2 hypervisor solution like VirtualBox, for instance would be an excellent choice so this is like i said this is how i started out um played around with throwing 
all kinds of virtual machines on there from old versions of Windows to different versions of Linux, trying to play around with it, playing around with the Linux desktop, um, trying to see if I could remote into the Linux system, which the first time I did that I thought was super cool um, when I had my laptop running. And then I was, you know, in my main um, laptop I was in the main OS, and I was able to remote into the virtual machine. Thought that was super cool. Uh, Played around with some file sharing. Um, And it's honestly a fantastic way to get into home labbing at virtually no cost. Um, But I have to be have to warn you um, that the cost can increment quite drastically quite quickly as you realize how amazing it is and you want to spend more money on it. Uh, But I guess you could say that's it's kind of like that with any hobby. Um, But yeah, that's basically how I started before I got my OG Optiplex 7010. Um, I was just spinning up tons and tons of virtual machines on my laptop, which the thing that's kind of ironic is nowadays I basically never spin up virtual machines on laptops or desktops. If I need a virtual machine, I'll just throw it on my Proxmox cluster and call it a day, (laughs) Um, even if it is just for, like, testing something. Um, But, yeah, that's where the OG Optiplex came in uh, because I had, you know, played around and did some experimenting um, with, you know, virtual machines on my laptop, basically as a proof of concept, just to make sure that I could get things to work before I actually decided to spend money on stuff. So speaking of spend money on stuff, that kind of moves us up to the next tier, which I'm saying is around a hundred dollars. And for a hundred dollars, I would probably kind of go the same route I went originally, which is to get some kind of old, like business business class um, desktop computer, Um, whether that's a tiny mini micro type system like a Lenovo or a Dell or a HP, like one of those one liter PCs, I'd either go something like that or potentially if I could find a better deal, I might get an actual like small form factor or mini tower type desktop also from one of those, you know, manufacturers and uh, business lines. Um, But what I would really try to focus on is getting either a 6th or a 7th gen, preferably an i7 if I could, uh, but definitely at least a 6th or a 7th gen processor at minimum. Um, If I could find something hot, something more high-end, like an 8th or ninth gen, that would be great. Uh, But I think... For for something like that, like an eighth or a ninth gen, you'd really have to be patient with it and look for a good deal. Um, I did some some eBay browsing uh, before uh, recording this podcast, and you can consistently find sixth and seventh gen for around that hundred dollar price point, which is why I said um, sixth or seventh gen. Although if you're really patient and really deal hunting, you might be able to squeeze out like an eighth or a ninth gen possibly uh, but again you would have to be kind of really patient and on the lookout for something like that um, and as far as what I would run on said machine um, it would kind of depend I guess on the processor which is why I said I would tr- preferably try to get an i7 mainly because the i7 would be hyper threaded so in the case of the sixth and the seventh gen i7s you would have four cores and eight threads compared to if you got the i5 variant you'd only have four cores and four threads so you'd have a little a few more threads to play with and you know give you more flexibility to play around with things like virtual machines and that kind of a thing. Um, but as far as things that I would run on it, it would, like I said, it would kind of depend on the CPU and the RAM configuration, but I would either throw just like a vanilla Linux distro on there. Um, maybe, maybe a uh, Linux desktop variant, maybe just a server variant with just a command line. I'm not sure. Uh, but I would either do that or I'd throw Proxmox on there and just have a few light VMs if I was doing Proxmox or if I was just doing a straight vanilla Linux install, I'd just probably do Docker containers because they get the job done. Um, and like I said uh, earlier, I would definitely run Pi-hole and some kind of VPN, like either OpenVPN or WireGuard. Probably go with WireGuard just because from a performance aspect, WireGuard 
generally has better speeds because it has a lot less overhead uh, than OpenVPN does. Uh, so probably go with that. And then depending on how much extra real estate I had, I might try to get something like Bitwarden on there for some self-hosted password, self-hosted uh, password management. And then if I was really feeling fancy and actually had extra storage might try to do some kind of like jellyfin um type solution to have some kind of like home media streaming stuff if assuming i had storage which for a hundred dollars that may or may not be the case i don't know uh if i already had like a, a flash drive or external hard drive with like some movies on there or something then it could just plug that in over usb or something uh but generally speaking uh, for $100, you're probably not going to have a ton of storage built into one of these boxes. Um, so if you have the extra storage, cool. Maybe get Jellyfin on there, but that's definitely more of a maybe. Um, and kind of like back to what I mentioned, that's basically how I started out, except the i7 was actually an i5, which I think was the i5-34... 750 something like that i don't remember exactly the the name of it uh, but it was an i5 which then i later upgrade upgraded to the i7 variant now the pros of this is one it the power draw is really low especially if you go for one of those like one liter pcs those things will idle that like six watts or something like that like really really small like very minimum not gonna have to worry about a ton of power draw and the other nice thing too is generally they're fairly upgradable like if you're only spending a hundred dollars you're probably going to be getting eight gigs of ram maybe 16 if you're lucky and then storage you're probably not going to be getting a whole lot if any um, so those are two things that you can easily upgrade down the line as you as you continue to grow out your home lab. Um, and potentially you could even upgrade the CPU as well. Um, although I've noticed that the, the 6th and 7th Gen i7 CPUs, for whatever reason, still tend to be expensive. So... I don't know, that might be something like further, further down the line, but it still at least is a possibility that you can have. So moving up to the next tier, um, I'm calling this the around $250 range. So you can't really get into rack mounted gear for that much. I mean, I guess you technically could. Uh, if you wanted to have a full-blown space heater, you could get, like, super ancient gear, but I would not recommend that. Um, but also the problem, too, is if you want to get into rack mount gear and actually rack mount it, you have to buy a rack, which those aren't exactly expensive, or aren't ex exactly inexpensive, rather. Um, so I would not go that route. So probably what I would do is if I only had, like, $250 to spend, I'd probably do exactly what I would do with the $100 tier, but add like a second machine to that. So add like another tiny mini micro machine or add another uh, desktop machine, maybe throw in a, a couple little smaller upgrades, like maybe get some extra RAM or maybe a little extra storage or something like that. Um, and then probably get like a super, one of those inexpensive, like small gigabit switches or something just to connect the two together uh, to have a little network going on um, and then I would because I have more hardware now I could throw a couple more more processing power I guess intense if you will uh, VMs so I'd probably get a GitLab server or something on there um, potentially a GitLab runner depending on how much ex extra overhead processing power I had um, and then maybe throw in like a couple development test environment VMs maybe again kind of depends on uh, what kind of compute I have um, now, if we double the budget to $500, here's where things start to get a little bit interesting. So if I had $500 and I was tasked with building out a home lab, I <laughs> would probably get back up to my normal tricks and start going old enterprise gear. Um, I found, in again, researching for this episode just on some, some quick searches, I found that you could get like a like a 15U rack or something like around that size for 120, 140 dollars somewhere in there. Pick up an R630 for a 
couple hundred bucks as well. Uh, get some kind of rack mount switch. Probably just keep it as gigabit. Um, now, I go with the R630 and not the R620, even though that's what I have for a couple of reasons. Um, one, the R630 is newer and has really dropped in price over the past couple months and years, um, making it a lot more enticing. Plus, you're going to get newer processors. You're going to get uh, DDR4 RAM rather than DDR3 RAM, so you're going to be saving some some power there. Um, and just overall, it's going to be a more efficient and more powerful system. So you're going to be able to run, you're going to get more cores, more threads. You're going to get you know more performance per watt, um, just an overall better system than the r620 for the money in my opinion um but now mind you that's not to say i'm getting rid of my r620 right now because it's still a workhorse um and with how specced up i've got that thing over the past couple few years of owning it um it would be quite expensive to replace it um with you know similar specs as far as like ram and and whatnot is concerned but the other reason why i pick this is the if you go the the desktop route for like the old business computers like the optiplexes for example they are fantastic machines and they are somewhat upgradable but there's a limit to it whereas the R630 and pretty much any rack mounted enterprise data center type server like that the amount of RAM you can throw in those things is absolutely astronomical. Like the maximum RAM capacity of this th of these things is more than <laughs> Apple's storage capacity on some of their laptops. <laughs> At least the base storage, anyway. Like you can throw literal terabytes worth of RAM into these things if you want to. So the amount of expansion is absolutely insane. And they, the other nice thing about the R630 is it has the, the Xeon V3 and V4 lines of CPUs. So if, say, you get one when you first buy it and it's, say, it's a... I don't know, an E5 2640V3 or something. It has two of them. Um, as you continue to grow out your home lab and, you know, save up some more money, and if for whatever reason those CPUs aren't doing it for you, you can get more processing power, more cores, more threads, upgrade to a V4 or something, and continue to give new life into your server. You can, like I mentioned, you can throw even more RAM at it. Um, the other benefit is the front of these things are have hot swappable drive bays, so you can throw more storage at them as well. Um, because they're Xeon CPUs rather than just Intel's core line of CPUs, they have a ton of PCIe lanes, so you can add all kinds of expansion cards from faster networking to PCIe storage to graphics cards even, although you do have to be careful with the graphics cards. You have to watch uh, kind of the power draw on those, but still, you have a ton of possibilities uh, with types of expansion that you can do, which allows you to kind of grow with this server and kind of build it and upgrade it over time as your needs increase so that's one reason why i would recommend that and probably go with that for this budget and also you get the added benefit of dell's ipmi solution idrac to allow you to remotely manage it um, so you can get access to the the virtual console um, assuming you have the enterprise license which a decent amount of them have but not all of them although you can buy licenses for them for like less than $30, so it's not all that hard to get one. Um, but that would give you access to the, the KVM feature, which will give you essentially like you're plugged in with a screen, mouse, and monitor without actually being plugged into the thing. So that is also a, a super nice feature. Um, now, as far as what I would be running on this thing, Proxmox, obviously. Um, I mean, I got tons of CPU cores and threads to take advantage of, got a good amount of RAM. Um, so I pretty much take everything that I had before, um, but ensure that I do have that GitLab server, GitLab runners, multiple testing environments to test building code on different operating systems and just kind of experimenting around, more playground type stuff. Um, so that would, would definitely be it. Now, 
I, I will also mention that you could create a super sick home lab setup with like tiny mini micro boxes and make a super low, ultra low power Proxmox cluster with those or even a Kubernetes cluster, and it would be absolutely incredible. Although I am a complete sucker and a simp for old enterprise gear, so that's why I ended up going with that route. Now, if we go into even bigger baller territory and go with a thousand dollars that kind of opens up some even more possibilities so for that what i would do is i would go again with some kind of rack get a a, a switch rack mount switch another r630 with that um, and then i would do some kind of network attached storage nas solution not entirely sure what I would do, like, per se, off the top of my head. I don't know if I'd go, like, an R730 for that or some other enterprise system or build my own. Not entirely sure, but I would at least make sure there's enough room for expansion since, you know, the one thing when it comes to a NAS is you want to ensure that you have room to expand over time um, so you can grow that pool. And obviously, if I'm going to get a NAS, you're going to have to have hard drives, um, so that'll be in there as well. Um, and then I would also try to get some 10 gig networking thrown in there as well. Now, I probably... May or may not get like a 10 gig, some kind of 10 gig in the switch that may or may not be in the price range, but at least to get some kind of like 10 gig card to directly connect the R630 and the NAS solution together so I can at least have a 10 gig link there, probably what I would do with that. Uh, and then if we up the budget again to $1,500 for this Probably again, kind of a, a similar theme here. Do everything I did at a thousand, but this time I would probably throw in like an M1 Mac Mini for like four or five hundred dollars somewhere in there. Just doesn't have to be anything fancy, could be the base model, I don't care. Mainly because I would probably just have this as a, a Mac OS testing slash build environment. Um, since not 100% sure if my Mac OS hackery of that uh, that virtual machine that I got working, not sure if that would be able to run on um, the Xeons that would be in the R630. So having just a dedicated Mac to do like testing and building on would be kind of just a nice to have. Um, plus at this point, if you're spending you know fifteen hundred dollars in one sitting on a home lab um i think you'll probably easily be able to meet whatever needs that you're trying to set unless you're actually trying to build a legit data center um which in that case fifteen hundred dollars ain't going to get you very far uh but as far as the trying to create a lab for hosting some some basic services as well as a, an environment that you can test things and kind of learn and develop your skills um i would say like fifteen hundred dollars is probably more than enough to get anyone kind of up and running um, and you'll probably have more hardware than you actually need uh, because uh, as much as I kind of hate to admit it my current home lab situation is definitely more hardware than I actually need yet I, <laughs> that doesn't stop me from uh, swapping pieces out and upgrading things and getting even more hardware uh, because that's what happens when um, uh, you have a hobby that you're really into and like sinking money into. Um, so we have two more kind of tiers, I guess, to this. The first one is honestly not interesting at all, which is the $2,000 tier. And the reason I say this isn't interesting at all is because I don't think there's really anything new that I would buy buy in this tier so i'd still keep the rack still keep the network switch still keep the nas the r630 mac mini you know keep all that basic stuff but i think at this point with that extra money i would look at 
doing upgrades. So look at, you know, more RAM for my Proxmox cluster, uh, better processors for maybe the NAS or the Proxmox cluster, one of the two. Uh, look at getting more storage, whether that's SSDs for the, the Proxmox server um, to have faster storage for the VMs or hard drives for the NAS to have that ex extra storage. Um, maybe upgrade the networking on the Mac Mini to find a 10 gig variant, uh, maybe some more RAM in there um something like that is probably what i would do but again if you um have drunken the tiny mini micro kool-aid you definitely could build one of the coolest high availability proxmox clusters with some of those like one liter pcs which would absolutely kick some serious butt um, in terms of, I mean, you would be drawing very little amounts of power. Um, you wouldn't necessarily have a ton of processing power, although, I, again, for two grand, you could get some pretty specced out machines with some fairly newer processors. So you could probably make a very solid, you know, three node cluster with some very high spec machines um, and you could definitely deal do some damage um, in, in the sense that you could have high availability you could set up kubernetes um, you could have tons of services running and not break a sweat it could be a pretty fantastic setup um, so if i wasn't a, a sucker for old enterprise gear that's probably the route that i would go but again i i, I like the blinky lights and the rack mounted gear too too much um, it, it's too tempting now here is the fun one and that being the blank check so I have a blank check to get whatever I want inside my home lab money being no option now I will show a little bit of restraint here because I'm not going to get an entire room filled of 42U racks with just loaded with the latest servers, all one U, so I can densely pack them and run all and run a legit data center in my house. Because that's honestly overkill. Uh, I would have absolutely zero use for all of that hardware. Um, and honestly, at that point, if I had that much hardware. It, it'd almost be kind of a waste to throw hypervisors on them all and, and run virtual machines. At that point, I might as well just run everything bare metal. But then again, I don't think Pi-hole needs, like, you know, hundreds of gigabytes, if not terabytes of RAM and, like, 56 cores. I, I just don't think it needs that for just one person. <laughs> now, if you, you know, were running a, an actual enterprise, um, yeah, of course. I mean, having multiple instances of pie hole on multiple servers, I mean, it makes sense. But for just one guy, I mean, as I guess as cool as it would be, it's, it, it's just not worth it. So I am going to show a little bit of restraint here. Um, but of course... I would still get a 42U rack, fully enclosed, of course, you know, with the, the door on the front and the back and all, the whole nine yards, all the bells and whistles, um, you know, the integrated power distribution unit, all that good stuff. So, so that's, that'd be one thing I'd get. Another thing I would get is an XServe, a 3 comma 1 totally maxed out XServe with a corresponding XServe RAID, because why not? I have the money to it because it's a blank check, so why not? The other thing I would do is I would have 10 gig minimum for all of the networking inside of the rack. So all of the servers would have a minimum of a 10 gig connection to the entire the entire network rack. Now, of course, there would probably still have to be a one gig switch thrown in there as well, just to connect other devices, you know, on the LAN, like any other desktops or whatnot that's not in the rack, but everything in the rack would be 10 gig minimum. And then I would probably even go further than that. And for all of the nodes running Proxmox and the NAS itself, have at least a 40 gig link on all of those. And potentially even maybe like a 100 gig link, just because, again, we're going as 
as as crazy as we can go here. So probably a hundred gig link for maybe the NAS, so it can have you know more bandwidth to be able to to push things around, um, and then the forty gig connection to all the Proxmox nodes to easily you know migrate VMs around and all that good stuff. But again. That might not even be needed because, again, since this is money, no option, the the NAS solution would be 100% all flash. Not necessarily sure if that would be like SSD, like SATA SSDs or NVMe SSDs, but regardless, 100% all flash so we can get as much data pumping through these, you know, 40 and 100 gig links as possible, get some high availability going around so we can throw VMs across all the different nodes in the Proxmox cluster. As far as what the Proxmox cluster nodes would look like, uh, they would definitely be all rack-mounted servers, of course, obviously. Um, and then as far as the CPUs and memory configuration, that's a little bit more tricky because from a value proposition standpoint, getting like the latest generation like rack mount systems from hardware vendors is honestly, I don't think that great of a deal. Um, so I think if you... Which I guess on the one sense this is a little ironic because this is supposed to be a blank check. Money doesn't matter, um, but still I, I would still kind of be taught, torn to like a used system. But I don't know. I've always been enticed by like AMD's Epic server lines mainly because of just how many darn cores they can fit on one of those CPUs. So I don't know, maybe maybe I would have like a cluster of some some AMD Epic servers maybe for, for the Proxmox cluster. I'm not entirely sure. But they, you, you already know that they would be high-end, top-of-the-line, cream-of-the-crop, fantastic servers. Um, and then... Of course, I would still go, in addition to the Xserve, I'd have some other Macs in there. At least one Apple Silicon Mac Mini with 10 gig networking, of course, because everything in the rack has to be at least bare minimum 10 gig. Um, but I might even potentially try to opt for a couple Mac Mini servers um, and have kind of like a mini Mac Mini data center um, because there, that is something that actually exists in the world is there are literal data centers out there with only Mac Minis in them. Um, pretty cool if you ask me. Um, so maybe something like that. Um, of course, I would have I would get a rack mount solution for them because I mean we got 42U to work with, um, so do something with that for sure. Um, probably get some high end UPSs or uh, basically the the power supplies um, that you can plug your servers into. So in the event of a power outage, uh, your servers still stay powered on. Now, the UPS is something that I didn't mention in any of the other price brackets and is technically currently something I don't even have in my own home lab. And honestly, I, it's kind of mixed on if, on if you should or shouldn't have one. Um, generally, it's a good idea to have one so you can gracefully shut down machines. Um, the only issue, I guess... And, and reservation I have with them is, granted, I would have to look more into it, but the main reservation I have with the UPS is I know you're able to, you know, connect it to a, like a control device, if you will, and then that device can be notified like if the power goes out and the and you're using power from the UPS, so you, so you then can send, you know, shutdown commands to all the systems. So that's good. So you can have a controlled shutdown. But if you shut everything down, how do you turn things back on? <laughs> now, I hear you saying, well, you can just use Wake on LAN or IPMI or something like that. And you're right. But if everything's shut down and you're not home, how do you get back into your network? Which that's the, the big thing for me as far as like my reservation for for actually getting a UPS because as awesome as it would be to make sure everything gracefully shuts down in the event that I would lose power and say I wasn't home to shut everything down um so having that done automated is great 
but I, I'm just not sure how it would turn things back on. Um, now, I'm not sure if you could configure the UPS in a way to send a command to the control device to wake it up, and then you could have some like some kind of script or logic or something to then wake everything else up. Um, because one of the issues... Well, I guess you could, could potentially configure your machines in the BIOS, where when power is restored, they boot back up. The only potential issue I see with that is if they're always plugged into the UPS and the idle power draw of just the systems being shut off but plugged in, because in case you weren't aware, um, just because your system is powered off doesn't mean it's drawing zero power, especially enterprise systems that have to run the baseboard management controllers, which allows the IPMI and the remote management features to work in the first place. Um, those take power, so assuming the UPS never died, like fully got its battery drained to depletion with everything powered off by the time the power kicked back on, technically, as far as the server was concerned, the power was never gone. So, it, it, to my understanding anyway, since the power was never gone, since there was still technically power coming from the UPS there there would be no signal that the power has been restored. Okay, time to boot back up. Now, granted, I haven't looked a ton into them, so this might just be completely wrong, um, but that's at least my understanding at the moment, which has been kind of why I've been hesitant about getting one. Um, because like I said, as cool as it would be to have one to ensure graceful shutdowns, um, if I can't power everything back up, it's doesn't do much good for me. Um, at least that's my perspective anyway. Um, but if money is no object, then I would probably buy one anyway or get multiple. Um, of course, they would be rack mounted because of course we have we have a 42U rack here, people. Um, so, so yeah, that is kind of the fully blown, if, I, if money was no object, home lab solution. Um, that I would I would go for now. Would I put you know all those servers to to use and and make excellent use of them and you know have their CPUs running basically at full tilt because of all the services I'd be running? Absolutely not. I am barely using anything on my uh, R620 as it stands right now. the The really only dent I'm putting into that system is RAM usage, and because I had that, I figured out how to tone turn down the ZFS cache. The RAM usage is sitting at like just over half, so I still even have more buffer room there. So, because I think generally the CPU usage on that thing is like maybe three to five percent on average <laughs> like it's very small and that's has that system has two 12 core 24 thread xeons in it so 48 threads so yeah i got a i got a lot, lot of overhead so we're, we're definitely not even using the current hardware i have to its fullest potential and mind you um i also have another hypervisor that also has two Xeons in it that are eight and six, eight cores, 16 threads respectively, so 32 threads, that is basically off 90% of the time that I basically boot up every now and then to make sure I keep up with its updates and whatnot and to have its backup synced to my NAS. Um, so yeah, I'm really not using um, the resources I have to their fullest potential, so I, I definitely wouldn't use this dream machine blank check solution to its fullest potential either although having a full 24 a full 42u rack with servers and a bunch of blinky lights just sounds absolutely incredible so so sign me up so that is how I would go about doing it. I'm sure you all have different ways that you would go about doing it. Um, again, like I said, if I wasn't such a sucker for old enterprise gear, I would probably elect to go more of like the tiny mini micro route, um, mainly for like the power draw reasons. Plus, they're so small you can fit them anywhere pretty much. Um, 
but yeah, that, that's how I would go about doing it. So before I leave you for today, let's get back to the trivia question for the week. So this week's trivia question is, what is the maximum supported resolution of DVI? If you said 2560 by 1440 at 60 hertz, you are correct. Now, there's technically, I guess, two kinds of DVI. There's the single link and the dual link. Um, this resolution is for the higher end, which is the dual link variant. So that is the maximum resolution for DVI. So before I actually leave you for this episode, I just want to again uh, thank you guys so much for, for listening and sharing and rating and reviewing and, and all that good stuff. But also, I want to wish you a happy new year again. And if you are traveling for the new year, safe travels to all of you. Or if you're traveling after the new year, again, safe travels. And uh, I hope you are enjoying some quality time with family and friends and hope you have have had a good 2023 and here is to 2024 so if you enjoy this episode you know what to do give it a rating review share like you guys have been doing um, and also if you have any questions about this episode if you have any any reasons why you think i'm an idiot for some of my choices and you would build your home lab differently of course you can send me an email at contact at darkassassinsinc.com link down in the show notes and that's going to do it for me in this episode of the dark assassins podcast until next time my fellow assassins remember Bull nothing equals true. If action not equal to null, return true. I'll see you next time on the Dark Assassins Podcast. You know, now that I think of it, though, if I had a blank check... Why don't I just get two 40U racks, one full of X serves, and one full of actual other computers? That's a good idea. Might go with that solution, too. I mean, it is a blank check, after all. <laughs>